Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for the Gallo cast. Yes, the brothers Gallo, Nick and Gio are back. It's like we're at the Thanksgiving dinner table with the brothers Gallo to talk all things compliance. So, guys, first of all, welcome. And I can't wait to see where today's discussion goes. I love the Gallo cast. Thanks for setting this up, Tom. Glad to be here. Yeah, welcome to our Festivus. Glad to be here. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. So I want to start off with a general topic around growth, explosive growth, controlled growth, planned growth. You guys have both been in private equity on the uh, private equity side of things. Now you have your own company, obviously. You guys have experienced growth. Up growth. I have watched you guys grow, compliance line grow over the years. It's been very exciting from the outside, but there are really some ethical and compliance issues around this I wanted to explore. We recently had a situation where one company in our space had dramatic growth in terms of pumping money into hire people. And then relatively short time thereafter, a lot of those people who got hired got laid off. That We've had situations in the compliance space where new investment or new owners come to a compliance product or service company and they want to ramp up and they want to see if they can get a big return on their investment. How do you guys think about growth? Are there ethical considerations? How do you acquire and retain talent in the midst of growth? And let's just see where you guys take it. So well, listen, if, for me, you, if you think that growth at all costs doesn't have any ethical implications and, hey, you know what, we're just going to do whatever we can and we're going to let the chips fall where they may, you might be unethical. At some level, I think it's a, there's nuance in the question, right? I think over the last 20 or 30 years, the, the disposability of everything has gone up. We throw everything away and companies are able now to throw employees away. So at some sort of at some level, there's like an existential question around what is the sort of purpose of an organization and what's the prioritization of its stakeholders. At a different level, look, this is how sort of business is done, right? Especially now that it's been in vogue uh, for many years for a company, or it's at least been shown to be possible for a company that's not making any cash, that's burning cash, to grow to astronomical levels. Look at how many years Amazon went without generating any cash. They were just kept reinvesting and kept raising more money and their stock price continued to go up and so forth. So that almost created like an archetype for the type of like startup VC based approach to growth that I think we're seeing in all pockets of the economy. And we've seen a bunch in our own space at some level, like either you're going to start selling cocaine or get a printing machine and start like laundering money or something, or those funds are going to dry up if there's no way to get, there's no way to get the capital back into the company, right? If the growth doesn't come or you can't continue to raise money, what are you going to do? Either the company's going to go under or you have to start trimming the fat as it were. And, you know, for me, I think at some level from back to your question about attracting and retaining talent, like anybody who went on the California gold rush, they knew that was like a high risk, high return type of a situation. I think it's incumbent on the company that's in this kind of a mode to be very clear about the risk of employment that somebody is stepping into. Many times someone's willing to roll the dice and they're going to say, hey, I want to kind of get involved in this startup and I know it's going to be crazy and we're going to be burning cash, but man, I have a feeling this is going to be the next unicorn or it's, you know, this company's ethos really resonates with me and its purpose really resonates with me. And I'm going to cast my lot in with that's a risk that somebody should be able to take. But and from an eye, eyes wide open perspective, I think some of the details of, of the deal you're talking about with OneTrust, they were on the Inc. 5000 list for many years and they were top of that thing and they were raising all this money and they had the inside story. Uh, is that they had planned to go public. They were buying up competitors and rolling this thing together. And they've had a lot of success from a top line growth perspective. Markets have fallen apart and SaaS companies' valuations have fallen through the, full, through the floor in public markets. So now that exit is no longer possible. Now, guess what's back in vogue? Now it's being cash flow positive is being back in vogue. They ended up get, letting go of a quarter of their workforce. And from the stories I've read on Reddit and on Twitter and on LinkedIn and stuff, the way they went about it seems a little bit less than ethical from my standpoint. Again, I don't know the nuance of it. I don't know what it's like to be the CEO of that company. People seem very caught off guard by it. And we've been growing a lot. And when we're hiring folks, we're trying to be very clear with people about what the lay of the land is here. Thank God we're not burning cash, but here's the lay of the land. This is what we're trying to achieve. And just giving people eyes wide open for the type of situation that they're stepping into. They're not stepping into a GE that's going to be steady state growing at the rate of GDP growth in the economy, 
we're trying to 10x that growth. There's risk that comes along with that. And I think if you can at least be eyes wide, you know, at least present that clearly to folks, that's at least a step toward a more ethical engagement. Yeah, I, I draw an analogy of this. There's this concept that's pretty well accepted. If you're taking money to from other people to invest, you should tell them what you're investing in, right? In case you don't have any exposure to this, if I'm running if I'm running a mutual fund and I say, "Hey, we're investing in technology companies," then I should actually invest in technology companies. If I'm starting a VC fund or a debt fund and say, "Hey, we're going to we're going to invest in European companies," then I should invest in that. And there should be a conversation that says, right. "Hey, what am I investing in?" Let's make it simpler. Let's say you go to your five best friends and say, hey, give me a grand. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to play this blackjack strategy that has this chance of winning. Give me some money, stake me, and then I'll go do that. Listen, if you do that, if you get that money from your friends and then you just show up at the roulette table and put it all on red once and then you lose it all, you haven't stood by that commitment to the people you took money from. So that's talking about money. Let's talk about the investment that your employees are making in right. your business. You're not just taking their money, <laughs> you're taking their life, you're taking their time, you're taking their, like, you're not just taking it from them, but you're accepting their investment in your company. The ethical thing to do, listen, there's no, Congress hasn't passed a law that you should do this, but the ethical thing to do is say, hey, I just want to let you know all this effort you're putting into our company, here's what's going on with it. And what it looks like if you're just burning a bunch of cash, if you're just putting your foot on the gas and driving as fast as you can with reckless abandon, or you're just saying, hey, you know what? We're playing this and if the markets do well, then it'll be great for everybody. And if, if inflation ticks up two points or the Fed raises interest rates, then it's probably all gonna come falling down like exactly. house of cards. Whatever the approach you're taking, the ethical thing to do is to be honest with these people who are giving you, they're not just giving you some effort and some work product, they're giving you their time, which is their life. The ethical thing to do is let them know, hey, guys, just so you know, we're putting it all on red this year, and we're going to put it all on here. You know what? We took out a bunch of debt, so we're super levered, and if we don't hit this thing next month, the whole company is probably going to fall apart. So I just want to let you know that the company you're investing in, that's what we're doing with the money you gave me to go to Vegas and work with. Or, hey, this is something that I cover when I'm doing recruiting for our technology team. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to go work for a VC. I want to be employee number four. That's fine. When I recruit with, when someone's interviewing and they've been through that cycle a few times, they're like, uh, how are you guys on cash flow? Like, when, like, how long is it going to be until we might shut the company down if you can't raise an up round? People who have been through it are asking that. And thankfully, we're in a position where we have a great answer to that. We're stable and growing quickly. We're dynamic and have plenty of cash flow. But the point is that like this, if you're going to work for a company, they might not even be a VC-backed company, but they might be over-levered. Or they might be mm -hmm. making huge bets that they have. It's got to hit red or we're completely wiped out. The ethical thing as a leader whether you're a manager or the CEO, is to let people know, hey guys, this is the game we're playing. Are we playing blackjack? Are we playing five card stud? Is there a chance for us to win? Or are we just, we're gonna see where, where the ball falls on the wheel? It's absolutely within the realm of ethics, how you handle this growth, both, to your point, Tom, both how you decide to grow, right? Are we just like pouring all the gas, putting our foot all the way down in the gas, how you decide to grow, but also how you communicate that to your employees right. is a massive expression of your ethical stance. Nick was saying, not just on how a company should grow, but what do you do with the lives of these people who are involved? And do you see them as disposable of, let's lay them all off now. If I can raise some money in a couple months, then I'll just put an Indeed post up and I'll just get a bunch of new people because they're just human resources. The way That's that right. you approach this growth and approach talking to your employees about what that means for their livelihood and their career and stuff is absolutely a critical decision that every leader should make, whether you're managing two people or you're deciding the direction of a company. But it's rooted in fear. The way guys handle this is rooted in fear. And they're scared to, mm -hmm. they're scared to tell people if things are going bad. And I think it's disrespectful, frankly. It's a disrespectful way to treat the human beings that have entrusted themselves to the mission that you have put on the wall and the banner that you've put up. It's crazy. I can keep nerding out on this, but I think it's- Let me pick up on one of the things you said, Nick. You talked about stakeholders and really expand that out to both of you guys have made clear to the compliance community that compliance line views numerous stakeholders to the company. Obviously, you guys, as the co-CEOs, 
are stakeholders. Your investors are stakeholders. Your employees are stakeholders. Your customers are stakeholders. But I would even say that you include the greater compliance community as 100%. stakeholders because of the content you put out and make available that we're going to talk about a little bit later. And so I really wanted to get your views on how you think through compliance line stakeholders and what do you try to bring to each one of those groups, starting with your employees? I think for our employees, our number one thing is we want to take the lessons we've learned from other companies that we've worked at and other companies we've invested in the past that have gotten it right and those that have gotten it wrong and try to take the best of those things and create an environment here where people can bring their whole selves to work. They can make their voice heard. They can let go of the sort of workplace trauma and baggage that they've gathered over the years of getting chewed up and spit out by the corporate machine. And we want to make people feel at home here. We do a thing called day zero for every new class of folks that come in. And some people think it's hokey and that's fine. We're going to keep doing it, but it's a way to get to know each other. And sometimes it's a room full of people crying because look, everybody has, is like fighting the battle of their lives and sharing some of those things and bringing some of those things to bear and shedding that sort of work facade that we all naturally start to, this carapace that we start to build up over time, shedding that and being on our authentic selves allows us to as a company, tap into the magic that each person has within them in a lot better. We get more employee engagement from a straight econ perspective. Our turnover is lower and it's a more fun place to work. So that's the type of environment we're trying to create. We don't always get it right. There's, you know, we're trying to build this little garden. Weeds come in the garden and you have to tend to that garden at all times because something's going to grow in it that you don't want. But from a from an employee stakeholder perspective, we want to start with that kind of a foundation. And then we want to allow for opportunities for we want to allow and try to create if we can keep growing the business in particular, create op opportunities for people to grow with us. It's nothing better. I love when we can do a promotion internally or when you see somebody who starts at one level and they can grow and be, be a not only an implicit, but an explicit leader in the company and really see them, you know, see those gears mesh, so to speak. So that's how I think about about our employee stakeholders. Yeah. And the old, the thing that I was taught in school is that companies are set up to maximize shareholder value. And the business roundtable has come out and who knows if you're working for one of those CEOs companies of since that statement, it feels completely different to be cared for by that company. But I think the view that makes more sense, and it's really the classical view, this is like how companies used to be run, is that everyone who you impact matters, right? We tell people here at Compliance Line that Everyone's a leader. You don't need to have a badge right. or the chevrons on your arm signifying your seniority in order to be a leader. A leader is just someone who influences and companies have an influence in all these areas. So I think that for the life that I want to live and the impact I want to have on the world, I want to consider all those people, to your point, Tom, including the compliance community, including the way that we, the extension through our clients and customers and users of how we can impact hopefully positively impact the reputation of compliance and ethics by helping those people do their job so that they look to their board and their execs like, oh, wow, you know what? This is what a, a, a healthy compliance program looks like. All of those implications, everyone you impact uh, is a stakeholder. It's If you go hiking in the woods and you just have your team of, you got your people, your family with you, and you leave a bunch of trash everywhere, you're having that impact. The next people who come along right. are going to do that. And you got to realize that it's not just the people you're with or the people you care about most. It's all the people you in, impact are your stakeholders. And the thing is, it's yes, it's ethical. It's also just the right thing to do and something that you can, you know, if you do it right, you should be proud of it. And it also, if you do it right, it supports the other goals for your customers and your stakeholders because all of this should and can work together. You don't have to be pitting your customers against your shareholders and figure out who you should turn your back on. And at the end of the day, even if you have to give some short-term trade-offs of, hey, I should treat this employee right, or I should give them some training instead of firing them or whatever it is, when you do that, it ends up uh, leading to better growth results or quality results or whatever it is. So, Nick, you have done a quite humorous series on <laughs> layoffs and ways not to lay off employees, although perhaps some are taking it as the way to do it. Yeah. So I grew up in the energy industry, and we're very used to layoffs in the energy industry. First of all, I've been laid off. The joke is don't ever piss off the person who works for you because in two years you may be working for him or mm -hmm. her at another company. So we've had a lot of experience with layoffs in the energy industry. And the former CCO of Baker Hughes gave a talk 
on what he thought were five key areas around layoffs. And he started with do it with dignity, but you can't just start your dignity process at the layoff. He really advocated, I think what I'm hearing from you guys, do things ethically throughout the life cycle of the employment relationship. And if it gets to the point where you do have to lay someone off because of economic conditions or other situations, if you do that with dignity, that's really the way to go. And so I wanted to maybe get your thoughts on if others listening to this are in the situation because of the current economic situation, they do need to do that. How would you really advocate sitting down or not making the decision to lay off, but executing that decision? So I I would think about it and maybe this is a, maybe, maybe this is idealized, but the way I would think about it is just be honest. <laughs> what a concept. Don't make it. I would just not try to spin, be super honest about it, not make it about myself and try to do my part to make it right for guys. So instead of like, I like the root of all of this, the way guys do it, when they say, when the typical picture is a meeting pops up on your calendar, you show up at it and then you get fired. You don't see it coming. You're totally blindsided by it. And I think, like I was saying earlier, companies do that. Leadership does that because they're scared of a mass exodus happening. What about if you said, Hey, listen, we need to do massive layoffs. Um, we need to, or look, Barry Waymiller is a great company. This guy who wrote this book, Everybody Matters, they hit some real headwinds and they didn't lay anybody off. What they ended up doing is people took voluntary PTO and manufacturing guys went from working 40 plus hours a week to 35 or 30 and everybody did it together. And I think that potential is there when you can make everybody part of something. If there's this sort of Chinese wall or this chasm between those who are in the know and those are not who are not in the know because they're not worthy of knowing that the weather pattern has changed and this journey is not is turning more perilous than we thought, then you're going to create that self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's one one way to do it, to just talk about, hey, these are some hard times that we're facing. We don't want to lay ev- everybody off. Here are some ideas. We're not doing 401k contributions or whatever. That's one way to do it. But if you have to actually do it, you could push it out 90 days and you can say, listen, in 90 days, we have to let all these people go. In the meantime, we are going to do some career counseling for you, or we're going to have transition services for you. And we're going to have career coaches and things like that. Those are some things to do that not only bring some respect to the table for the people that have actually entrusted their careers with you and your company, but it also is doing your part from a posture of humility to help them land on their feet and them not feel chewed up and spit out. And it's a sick way to, to treat people, frankly. But look, at the same time, like if if a business's first goal, first and foremost, is to stay in business and this thing has to happen from time to time, then I think there's a more graceful way to do it than, has, than what has become the sort of norm right now. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think where my mind goes to some of the things Nick was talking about and how to handle layoffs is how do you make the decision to do it, right? How do you avoid it? How do you, how does the diktat from on high come down in the right way? I think it seemed like part of what you were asking, Tom, is if I'm a middle manager and someone just told me to lay off these three people and I have to deliver the message, how do I do that? I think doing it with dignity helps. I would, I would think of don't start with, hey, you know what? This is really hard for me. I want to tell you how sad I am that I have to do this. And let me tell you how this is really ruining my day that I have to fire you. Don't do that. (laughs) That person doesn't care how sad you are that you're removing their ability to earn a paycheck for the time being. Focus on the other person. Try to have empathy. Try to put yourself in those shoes. If you haven't, like you said, Todd, Tom, maybe you've been through it before and you can reflect on what that was like. But if not, you know, I think being transparent about it giving them some time to process it and offering to have a conversation about it can help start that transition and see how you can help them offer your network or say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to get a few people who are part of this. We're going to do a weekly check-in. I want to make sure you guys are doing all right and see if I can help you guys review your resume or something like that. See if you can give a little bit of what you still have, right? While as hard as that, (laughs) as hard as it's been to fire them, you're also going to show up to work tomorrow and you're not wondering how to pay rent. So see if you can help those people out. If you're in this position where the die is cast and you have there's nothing that you can do about it, see if you can help them and see if there's also a cultural message that goes on in here because the stuff is going to get back to other people on the team of, hey, you know what? The big bosses upstairs made this decision. Sally, our manager, she really had her back. And I heard from two of the people who got laid off, but she checked in on them and she's trying to help them. It kind of, it's really unfortunate that this is all happening, but at least Sally, she's going to have our back through thick and thin. 
that there are all these microcultures throughout an organization. And regardless of what the big bosses or the VPs do, you can run your team in a certain way and you can have an impact on that individual person and on your culture by treating people with dignity. Let me take something you just said, Gio, and go in a completely different direction because it's so unique Uh and I don't think it gets enough play. You just said the word microcultures. Yeah. Could you explain what a microculture is, how it relates to an organization, and why compliance needs to be so aware of a microculture? Yeah, it's really big. I think it's great that over the recent years, companies and ethics experts have been talking more about that cultural element because it's so of that so much of that je ne sais quoi of what is hard about what we're doing. There, just like your body has your whole body and your systems and your limbs, and you can break it down to a cell or whatever, or just like your city has a culture. We're really friendly or we're really hard charging. And then your neighborhood has a culture and on this block or in this neighborhood, we're like this. And then your house has a culture and maybe your teenagers and your little kids have different cultures. That's how humans operate. We organize and we self-select and we create interpersonal dynamics within these different layers of how we're associated. And one doesn't necessarily overpower the other, but you can get these different dynamics. But that happens in a company. This is a company that we do things this way, or we really care about clients, or we're super innovative. That thing is going to be expressed differently in your operations versus your finance team versus your marketing team or whatever. And then within those teams, it gets down to probably the first organizing layer outside of an individual. It might be some friends, or it might be a manager in their team or whatever it is. They all have their own little cultures and it's driven by the strong personalities on a team. It's driven by the history of what that specific team or division or something has experienced. Obviously your principles and your policies and things like that impact it. But I think a huge part of this, Tom, is that the managers that you have in place, that's why we call, we talk about the mood at the middle. And we talk about if you want to really transform your company to be more ethical, then you have to get ambassadors going and you have to get collaboration with those middle managers because that's the way in a, hierarch- in a hierarchical organization, that is the strongest force of communication in every employee's life. It's their manager. Right. It's not that thing that the CEO said for three minutes at the annual conference. It's not, sorry to say, it's not the newsletter that compliance sends around each week or each month. The strongest force in their life is that manager and how they show up and how they talk to people and whether they reinforce what the CEO said or what this other division is working on, or we need to make sure that we don't cause problems for the support team, or they pick up that banner for the ethics team and say, hey guys, we need to make sure we do this. Get your training done. Hey, you know what? Like we got to check on this stuff because we need to make sure that we don't cause conflicts of interest and stuff like that. That that manager is creating their own little microculture. And the encouraging thing to me is if you're not a CEO, if you're not the chairman of the board of the whole company, you still have that opportunity to be an influence. Like I said, we say here that everybody's a leader. When we do that day zero and Nick and I spend a whole day with everyone on their first day or their day zero of their job, we tell them you're part of the team now and you can influence people to support our values and to live this out. A manager is going to be able to do that. So even if you don't like the direction that your CEO is taking, or even if you think that your marketing team is greenwashing ESG or whatever it is, you can lead your team in a way. And you can also find those peers and those colleagues and those allies across the organization where, you know what, they're going to be on board. Even if I can't get all 40 middle managers to do what I need, let me find the three or four that will partner with me because they're going to create a strong culture and then we can build it from there because all cultures are built incrementally. Nothing is built by just, it's not like dropping a prefab house on a lot and just cool. Now we have a culture. It's all these micro inputs to create a micro culture. Well, that really leads to, and that's a perfect segue to our next segment. We had two disparate enforcement actions that I wanted to use to introduce the next topic. The first was the Glencore FCPA enforcement action where it appeared bribery and corruption was actually an established business practice within the company that they use. But the second one was an SEC enforcement action against EY, Ernst & Young, for cheating on their uh, CPA exams. And as the son of educators, I'm always offended when people cheat on tests, but that they were, SEC was much more than offended. They slapped them with a hundred million dollar fine. And partly because of the ubiquitousness of the cheating scandal within EY, 
part of it was EY's failure or non-cooperation with the Securities and Exchange Commission during the investigation phase of this matter. But I wanted to use both of those cases and really pick up on your last point, Gio, which is when you have either a business practice around bribery and corruption, or you have systemic ethical violations such as EY had in their CPA cheating scandal, how can you or how would you advise or how would you guys advise a company to begin to change after the enforcement action is ended or even during the pendency of the investigation. And you started to talk about that, Geo, in terms of you can't do it all at once. It has to be incrementally. But how would you help a major public company think through that change? One thing that I would take from that microculture discussion is I would set KPIs or OKRs or some acronym that is related to the goals that you set and the things that you measure about how well are my managers participating in this? Because I think we tend to want to, we talk about getting all the employees to do their training and we talk about, hey, we want to get some tone at the top and we want to get the CEO to reinforce or co-sign our initiatives. But if you're trying to transform this whole thing, I think you got to get to that kind of base unit. Yes, you're going to probably send an email to every employee, but I would start looking at, hey, How can we measure or collect some data or reinforce how much each manager is participating in this? Because that's how your culture is going to change. You could do that through the hierarchy. The CEO says it, and then you make sure that all the VPs say it, and then they make sure that all the directors say it, and then the senior managers all the way down. The likelihood of that cascading through all those layers cleanly and just counting on the fact that the CEO says it, it all going down through the org chart is probably pretty low. And even if it is, you want to try to get that next layer above the front line of what the, all the employers are doing and saying, hey, how much adherence, how much compliance, how much buy-in am I getting from those managers and find a way to measure that and respond to it and fix it. It can be a simple form. There's all this stuff you can do in an integration with Slack that asks somebody a question once a week or once a month. There are all these ways to do something right. simple. Listen, if you're about to pay a hundred million dollars for cheating on your CPA exams, you could probably spend 10 grand and get something set up for the whole company. You just say, Hey, did you reinforce this week? Did you talk about this week? Have you seen anything or whatever it is? There are a bunch of ways to do it, but I like the prospect of if you're really trying, you're running this big cruise ship and you need to start changing the direction of it, instead of just issuing a plan and then hoping that when you get audited in a year, it's better, start measuring it on a weekly basis and see if your managers are on board with it and if they're taking actual action. I'll just say, I came up through KPMG and ENY was a big rival. Not that shocked. This is classic ENY. <laughs> I'm kidding. I am totally yeah, kidding. Yeah, you, you, I think I remember you turned <laughs> down a job with them because you said, ah, these, I don't know. I don't agree with their scruples. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm 100% kidding. <laughs> so, but Gio, how, or excuse me, Nick, how do you really, in addition to moving it down, how would you suggest a company either monitor or take data or other information to to try to update and improve on a go forward basis? I don't know, man. It's a really tough question, especially if you go back to the Glencore thing. It is how do you change a whole culture? It's a tough, it's a tough thing. You have to do it step by step. It's like climbing a mountain. What's nice though is that like everything else, I think changing a culture happens little by little then all at once. And that is because it's a game of hearts and minds. And there is a certain contagion to an idea that is possible if you can be persuasive enough about the authenticity of the, it's going to come from like a top to bottom, like reinvention of ways of doing business. If you, the more you dig into the Glencore story, it's just wild. It's just wild. It's like at every turn, it's almost like the whole place was like birthed from corruption. And sometimes a surgery is going to be harder if it's, if it's the cancer's gotten into all the organs, you know what I'm saying? Like it's possible to change it, but it's going to have to come from like a full reinvention. And yeah, I don't know how I'd prescribe it. Like in prepping for this call, <laughs> I went onto their, their values page and that is a nice looking values page. I'll tell you, Ooh. they got little video, yeah. they have a whole values book. And in the wake of this thing, it makes those things, that whole page look like kind of a joke. Given that it wasn't happening at a low level, it was happening at the top level. It was like the strategy. It was like the secret way that the company did business. So a full overhaul of that whole thing, it's going to take a little bit of time and it's going to have to take consistent effort over an extended period of time for the folks within the organization to 
look past the sort of wink and a nod that was clearly must have been in place for the last 20, 30 years as that company has come to so much power. Let me change our topic just a little bit here. We've had a couple of recent examples where companies and CEOs of companies have either criticized employees who raised internal concerns about how the company was run. We had the Coinbase founder say that was indeed unethical for employees to raise concerns. We had Elon Musk back when he was trying to buy Twitter, (laughs) trying to expand Twitter at the same time, firing SpaceX employees who brought forward complaints. And I wanted to maybe get your thoughts on, I think everyone listening to this would agree that's wrong, but how does that, what message does that send to your employees? How do employees feel valued if the leader of an organization, whether it be the founder or the CEO, starts making those statements and what's going to be the negative impacts to those companies going forward? <laughs> what a negative time. Can you imagine as a compliance leader, even if you're just in HR or someone who cares about this employee engagement issue, and you spend all this time trying to get employees to believe that you care what they think and you want to hear what they have to say and all of that. And then the CEO comes over the top and says, Hey, I don't want to hear it from any of you. It's brutal. It like in, in a case like that. So in case it's not clear, I think it's unethical for you to tell your employees that them speaking up about a problem is unethical. The, the, the whole theory of speak up, listen up culture, the whole idea of having humans as sensors and eliciting information from them is you want to know if they see a fire. You want to know if they see that this train's about to crash and just to tell them, hey, this is off limits. I don't want to hear any criticism of this. It just in my bones, it goes so against everything that I understand this to be. It shows a lot of disrespect for employees. It gets back to that, that idea that these human resources are disposable because just to say you're not allowed to have any problem with this is just such a bad message that it also, I I don't know if this is a strategy or a tactic or if the people doing this realize the follow on impacts of it, but you say that about that. And then people are like, all right, I'm going to shut up about a bunch of things because obviously you don't think that fine. You don't want me to criticize that. I'm not going to criticize this fraud and I'm not going to criticize this bribe and I'm not going to criticize this other thing. Like it's very difficult, I think, to selectively say, hey, keep your mouth shut about this. I don't want anyone to question anyone in authority about this thing, but also these other things let us know because we'll be really nice about those. It's, uh, I mean, to me, it seems so detrimental to a culture. Maybe it's good if you want a really strong command and control culture where you want to just lock everything down and you want everybody just living in fear of someone coming down on them and not using their discretion and their brains. But I think that makes it really hard for an ethics expert to come around that and say, hey, I guess I got to ignore everything you bring up about this, but be sure to tell me about some of these other things. (laughs) It's got to be one of the most crippling things to like the effort and the initiatives of a compliance leader to have such a counter cultural message be presented by that by the CEO. Nick? I think they're treating a symptom as if it's the problem. You know what I'm saying? Like most, all the studies have shown that if somebody's like a whistleblower, they're going to try to whistleblow inside the organization a couple of times before they go outside the organization. There's this like presupposition, at least in that thread you sent. Our culture is to, what is it? Like criticize internally, but praise externally. And that's first of all bizarre, but like the facts are the facts. You know what I'm saying? The fact that's happening clearly shows that they don't have a transparent culture of candor within the organization. Otherwise they would have never had to go outside of the organization if that picture and that data around those whistleblower studies is really a picture of human nature and how humans behave in different power structures. So to Gio's point, I think it's I think it's bizarre and it's it's very counterintuitive. But again, if you read that thing, it comes from such a like there's such a voice of like entitlement, and there's such a voice of fear, and such a clear and elevated view of self. <laughs> like, how dare you speak out against the king? That's the vibe I was getting reading that Twitter. Thread. Let me change the topic to something hopefully a bit more upbeat. And that is, I was going to ask you what's new at Compliance Line, but I know what's new at at Compliance Line, and that's the ethics verse. First of all, I'm absolutely livid you thought of that before me. Great title. But tell us about the ethics verse, what it is now, and maybe where you see this going. 
So the thing that always that you will always hear us talk about is this special thing that ethics and compliance is. And it goes a little bit back to your stakeholder question about the community itself being a stakeholder. And we have this really special thing. Many of us are third line or feel like they're cost centers and so forth, but we have this huge opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, to expand our network and connect with other folks and share tactics and struggles and techniques and successes and stuff like that. So we can elevate ourselves forward in a much more meaningful way. And so the ethics verse is really just our desire to contribute something to this culture and be a weekly meeting spot where folks can come in and have lunch with us or have a cup of coffee with us along with some guests and some thought leaders to talk about topics that can help make their lives easier, to help make their 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 job more more fun, to make their impact bigger and so forth. So each week at noon, we have a webinar where we do a book giveaway and we have somebody come on to talk about a particular topic. And I can guarantee they're not thinly veiled sales presentations like some other webinars in our space, mm -hmm. but they're really focused on trying to sow seeds of positivity and trying to, again, be that, be that, be that sort of central water cooler for the ENC community where folks can come and sharpen their sword a little bit. So where we see it going is we hope that it's, we can get some really good content and what's where, what I'd like to do, not everybody has an hour every week, but we're starting to try to edit these down to little more bite-sized pieces. And when you go through your Twitter feed or you go through your LinkedIn feed, you can at least get one gem from it and maybe follow up and watch it, watch the replay or whatever. The guests that you have and the topics that you guys are currently talking about that, are you taking suggestions from community members or how are you formulating what to talk about over a cup of coffee? That's a great question. So what we're trying to do is hear what people are talking about. Some of a, it's a hodgepodge, honestly. We talk to cert, certain people that we want to do something with. They have some good ideas. We get some suggestions from folks, some client conversations. We can see an amalgamation of a particular problem that a lot of folks are struggling with. Sometimes it's just a cool topic. Like today, we're talking with Mary Inman about the FinCEN thing. She's great. She's always a lot of fun to chat with. And the whole goal, again, is we're just trying to satisfy this thesis of how can we add value? Like, how can we make this worthwhile for somebody where it's not an infomercial for our products? Like, you'll find our products if you're interested in them. If you have a great solution with one of our worthy competitors, then great. Run with it and make your workplace better. But yeah, so we're always open to ideas. You can hit us on LinkedIn or send me an idea for topic. Send me an idea for a topic or send it to our marketing department. And what's fun about this is like, we're, we're going to be doing 50 plus a year, not counting our on-demand ones. So it gives us a lot of budget, so to speak, to have a lot of fun conversations with interesting folks. So we are all ears for topics. Yeah. And part of the approach this time, you touched on the stakeholder thing earlier. What we realized as we got into this, like we've been blessed and helped and taught by so many other great people in this community. You are at the top of that list, Tom. And there's so much that we've learned about compliance and ethics and culture from other people just sharing their insight with us. And we're at a place right now where two really cool things are happening. One is we're like really well connected with a bunch of people around this community that we love, that they have genius to offer as well. And we have a platform where we can do that. And the other thing like around the veiled sales pitch is we've realized that in this market, like just pounding somebody with a bunch of cold calls and sending them a bunch of flyers and inviting them to learn where it's just, why don't you just learn about this thing I want to sell you? It's unethical. Maybe it's just annoying. I don't know. But we realized <laughs> that we don't need to do that because over time we've realized we have, our company cares for a total of over 8 million employees across all of our clients. Our name is getting out there and we don't need to beat somebody overhead, over the head with a sales pitch. And we can use our marketing budget and we can use this platform and we can use the people who know us to just share this around. When we were a smaller company or if I was just like a solo consultant, I couldn't, we couldn't put this money into this production and putting this stuff out there. But now we can and we've chosen to do that to give to the community. And we just think that it's going to help elevate the, the quality and the strength of compliance programs around, if we can just share these great ideas around, it's going to help people in the community. And we think that us engaging with this community is going to eventually might lead to some new relationships where we can help people out, but it doesn't need to be a sales pitch all the time. How annoying. And Nick, tell us about the current book challenge. So I just wrapped it up. It was, I was trying to read 10 books in June and I read them and I actually got through 11 
And it was a little taste of the year of 2020 when I tried to run at 100 books. And I don't know, I love these book challenges. It makes me restructure my life and double down on it. And I just, when you're, when I'm reading that much, you know, I get to get through a bunch of books that I've been thinking of or that have been piling up on my wish list. And there were some really, some really good ones that I was able to, to get through this last month. I love it. I love it. I may do another one. It's a little hard to do for 12 months in a row, but I may try to do one or two more by, by the end of the year, but it's great. I get so many great recommendations. So I don't waste any time on any like crappy books. They're all like nine and 10 bookworm kind of books. And uh, there's so many great ideas that either reinforce what we're doing or give us new ideas for new topics to start incorporating. There's what I, again, what I love about ethics and compliance is it's a mix of everything. There's persuasion in it and there's communication in it and there's marketing in it and there's law in it and there's business in it and there's ROI in it. It's like, it's, and it speaks to the fact that ethics and compliance really is that circulatory system of the organization. It does touch all the different parts of everything. And there's so many tools that are right there for us to start using to elevate our impact. Like I always say, like Gio always says, over the next five and 10 years, the companies that really engage and really actualize their ethics and compliance program to unleash and really ultimately help unleash the magic of their workforce are going to separate from the companies that just, you know, greenwash their way through this thing. That sort of hollow wokeism that a lot of companies look at the Glencore thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that is fake. That, that values page is fake. And the employees reading it who know that the company is built on lies they have to be laughing to themselves about it. And I'm sure there's screenshots on Slack of people sniggering at these values and how they're not act actually lived out. So if we can actualize that and we can breathe life into these values and close that gap between the aspirational and the act cultures that our employees are living in, there's so much magic that gets unleashed. Yeah, it's, it was a fun, a fun challenge. So gents, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but if our listeners wanted uh, more information on Compliance Line or gotten to get in touch with either of you guys or your marketing team, what would be the best way for them to do? You can hit us on LinkedIn. You can come to our website and request a demo or request more information. You can message me or Geo on LinkedIn or on Twitter, or you can put one of those bat signals up of our faces, which is on the Gallocast here, and we'll see it. We'll see it. On a clear night, we'll see it. All right, gents, I can't wait to get together in August and see what we come up with. All right, Thanks brother. So Thanks so much. See you guys. Thanks, Tom.